Welcome to Tales of Blue. My next guest appeared 99 times for City between 1984 and 1986, scoring 16 goals along the way, including some spectacular strikes as City clinched promotion back to the first division in May 1985. Signed by Billy McNeil for a bargain 65,000 from Plymouth Argyle in the summer of 1984, his City career was then cut ruthlessly short by the same manager when he was told he was surplus to requirements, joining Coventry City in a strange deal that brought keeper Perry Sutton to Main Road. A warm welcome to David Phillips. So David, a good season for Plymouth. They reached the semi-finals of the FA Cup and a move to City comes. How did that come about? When did you first move, hear of the move? The main road. Well, first and foremost, it was it was a great year in 1984. Uh, not only did Plymouth Argyle reach the semi-finals of the the FA Cup, where we got beaten by Watford at Villa Park, um, but also got my first international cap against England as well, up at Wrexham. Made my debut about them, and I had a phone call from from Manchester City and, and from Billy McNeil, and just wanted to know would I be interested in in going to Manchester City. Uh, at this time, Plymouth Argyle had offered me a, a new contract, a new revised contract. But when you have the, the lure of a massive club like Manchester City, it really, really was a, an opportunity that I couldn't uh, turn down. So I spoke to Billy and Billy said, well, let's go meet at Cheltenham, roughly about halfway. Uh, let's have a chat and let's see if you, you fancy coming up. So when I met Ma uh, Billy McNeil uh, in Cheltenham, he sold me the club. He didn't really have to anyway. Yeah. Uh, and then it was the opportunity. My contract was out. Uh, and so it was a case of just them organising between themselves what sort of fee was going to be paid. 65000 yeah. was what they paid for me in the end, um, which I think is a little bit of a bargain. It's not yeah. even a week's wages nowadays, <laughs> no, is it? No, no. Um, so on that basis, uh, I came up to, to, to Manchester City. So did you move up to Manchester or did you commute to start with? No, obviously it's, it's, it's far too yeah, far. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they were fantastic. You know, um, a lot of players, a lot of people were, were, were helping me move, uh, find property, etc. Ken Barnes was one of those yeah. um, who showed me a couple of different areas. And as it materialised, I moved into uh, Turnbury Drive in, in Wilmslow. Oh, right. So well, did you know many of the lads already at City or were they all new sort of teammates to you? And how did you find sort of the, the squad going in? It was This is 80, 1984. Yeah. Billy McNeil's second season yeah. at City and City tipped strongly for a promotion push that season. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I didn't know anyone. Um, even though that I played the uh, the first game against uh, England and uh, where Plymouth Argyle were, they weren't in the same league as Manchester City. We never came across them as such. So it was it's basically coming into a new environment, new players, etc. Um, was it going to be difficult for me? Not really, because my father was in the Royal Air Force. Uh, we were used to like you know going to different schools. Where I you know I lived in Holland, I lived in Wales, brought up in Wales. Ended up back in England. So the change of area. So the change of area was was never going to be a problem for me. It was always the same for um, you know my, my brothers and sisters as well. They moved around, etc. My sister still lives not too far from Manchester. Um, my other brother lives down in uh, in Dorset. Unfortunately, my father and uh, mum have passed away. Um, but I was used to to moving, so moving to to Manchester City was never going to be a problem. But I still remember the first couple of days I was in the hotel. I actually get a, a phone call from reception say, well, I've got a couple of friends of yours down in reception. I think, well, I haven't got any friends <laughs> in Manchester. And it was uh, Jim Tolmey and Neil McNabb. Okay. So uh, they, they just come in and say, well, look, you know, do you fancy going for a beer? Uh, we're playing a game of golf later. Do you fancy a game of golf? And so with those two, they made me feel really welcome. Yeah. Thanks. And there's a few Scottish lads in the squad around that time, wasn't there? So this was your track suit. Here. Yeah. Welcome to City. Yeah. You're still fitting that now, I think. I think so, yeah. I, 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 it might actually be a little bit too big for me now. I've lost a little bit of weight, but uh, no joking apart, you know, it brings back so many good memories and, uh, you know, such fondness of being associated with Manchester City, being there for two years. I would love to have been there a lot, yeah. lot longer, but, um, you know, that's football. So your debut comes, I believe, at Wimbledon, start of that season. Oh, well, we actually wore the away kit that day, but this yeah. was that home kit that season. Yeah. And Phillips on. Did anyone ever associate the sponsor? With yeah, the it's, it's quite, quite, it quite. Part of the deal. No, it, it, it wasn't. Not for sixty-five thousand <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But um, in, in respect of that, there's so many people who've actually turned around and said, "Well, did you have a, a family member who sponsored, you know, yourself and the shirts?" And I said, "Well, if you have a look closely, there's only one L." But um, it brought me a lot of good luck, yeah. especially wearing the number six as well. 
uh, and it was an excellent season for me. Some great goals, obviously. This shirt was Paul Simpson's number yeah. seven. Yeah. So you would get on to the final game of the season yeah. in a little while. Yeah. But it had a big impact that season, Simo, but sort of came into the squad a bit later. He yeah. He stuttered a little bit towards the end of the season. Uh -huh. But, you know, Simo, Simo was a good player, you know, and when you look at the, the players that we had, we had a good blend of youth and experience. I'm only 21, just turned 21 when I first came along. Um, you know, people like Steve Kinsey, Andy May, yeah. were there or thereabouts, you know, playing in the first team. But then you had uh, Paul Power, who is a little bit older than ourselves, maybe eight or nine years older than yeah. ourselves. Um, Mick McCarthy was maybe four years older than ourselves. So players of good experience, Kenny Clements as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a good blend of youth and experience. And, you know, that, that bode us well for that season. Absolutely. So this was the style that you made your debut in. Yeah. The stripes. Good memories. What memories come back? A particular game from that season stands out, David? Oh, there's there's plenty of games. Um, obviously, we, we, we can talk about the, the game at the end against Charlton, mm -hmm. uh, where I scored a couple of goals. Obviously, the first one was very important. You know, we were in third place at the at the time. We had to go and win that game. Yeah. Um, and it, it was just a, an unbelievable game. People turned around and said, well, there's supposed to be 47,000 people in the stadium. <laughs> I think if you had another 10,000, yeah. you wouldn't be too far wrong. Because if you looked at all the aisles... Yeah. You know, there was not any way you could see any concrete. Well, there was, it was some just... talk that the players would get a, an appearance for a crowd bonus. Once it went a certain number, yeah. they'd get a bonus, but I don't think it was ever allowed to. No, I don't think so. No, I think with Peter Swales, he was always very uh, coy on exactly what the uh, the attendances were. You know, and that day there must have been fifty five thousand people in the stadium. Did you have much interaction with the chairman, Peter Swales? Was he seen much around the club? Not really, you know, at the end of the day, um, it, we used to go and change there at Main Road before we went off to the, the training ground around the corner. So you you got to see some of the backroom staff, you know, people like uh, Bernard Holford, for example, you know, we got to know him very, very well. Uh, but generally, didn't really see a lot of Peter Swales. Obviously, all the coaching staff, whether it be for the, for the first team or for the reserves, you know, we saw an awful lot of them. Yeah. Um, but because we trained, uh, sorry, because we... Uh, changed in the actual uh, home team dressing room you know we did get to see a lot of people involved behind the scenes but not really yeah. so much of Peter Swales. Good stuff. So obviously the, the Charlton <laughs> game last game of the season is a great memory but is there any other memories from that season David that sticks out maybe not playing memories something for a pre-season? Yeah I would or... say uh, there, was, there was always this talk about this tour that we went off to in, in Malaysia and uh, people were asking, why were we travelling like 12, 13 hours? This was mid-season. Yeah, this is mid-season, just after, I think it's about January sort of time. And um, people were asking, why were we going that length to uh, to go and play a, a couple of testimonials or whatever? But it was all to do with the finance. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I, I still remember Norman Luff, the, the doctor, when we got to the, the airport, he was asked to open up his case and he's got a file of heroin. And uh, all of a sudden, the official are wanting to take him away, but he's having to say, you know, I am a doctor, yeah. this is my uh, official, uh, you know, passes, etc. Uh, and he was okay, but um, there were a couple of little stories that I remember from uh, that trip in Malaysia. It was one that we went to a place called Trenganu, which is about an hour's flight from Kuala Lumpur. And we got this coach, and we uh, started driving in towards where the, uh, the hotel was. It was a five-star hotel. It might maybe a six-star hotel. Yeah. It was absolutely stunning, absolutely beautiful. Uh, it was all well. It was owned by Shell, and next to him was a, a load of corrugated houses, a little township. And um, so I had to go walk on the beach this one one day. And uh, I said to Graham Baker, I said, "Look, you know, I've been reading up about this place. I said there's lots of turtles around. And I said we might see a little bit of like you know eco stuff, etc." Uh, Nicky Reed was about 100 yards in front of us, and he's going, guys, 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 come and have a look at this. I said, I said to Bates, I said, there you go, there's your first turtle. <laughs> so as we got a little bit closer, I said to Bates, it's not a turtle. And then also looked in, and it was a snake, it was a sea snake. <laughs> and reedy has gone down to go and pick it up, and I've gone, Reed, don't touch that snake. I said, because they are some of the most venomous ones coming from the water. And with that, with all the kerfuffle, this uh, guy came out of this little township with a machete, and he's gone... And he's gone bang, bang. So he's actually killed the snake. And he's gone, no, what, don't go anywhere near it. So, but that was really all over. He, you know, he was always one of those that he, he would take the uh, take the little bit of a risk, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah. But not that time. Yeah. But um, I still remember the uh, the spiders. They were huge. Um, walking along in the, inside the dressing room, there was like cockroaches. And you put your foot on a cockroach, and you nearly twisted your ankle. They were that huge. Um, but 
deep down, you know, that chore shouldn't have happened. Yeah. You know, that was just uh, down to finance. But thankfully, at the end, you know, with that game against Charlton, we were able to get uh, the three points, the two points and promotion. So it was a little bit of stumble for Charlton. There was a game at Notts County. Oh, where yeah. got a little bit. I think you got some um, yeah, it, extra it, it, pep talk in the dressing room from yeah, a few of the fans. Yeah, absolutely into. right. Absolutely right. And, you know, I remember the, that Meadow Lane that, um, you know, things don't go particularly well. Um, and we've gone down the tunnel, followed by a, a quite a few lot of Man City fans, which I can understand because you know they desperately wanted to yeah. get promoted, same as us. But it felt we were very, it yeah. felt it was slipping away. And it was, you know, and we got verbally abused and, and whatever, and it wasn't particularly nice. Um, so we knew that when we came to this home game against Charlton, we still had an opportunity of getting promoted. Mm. Uh, and thankfully, Again, I got the first. The yeah, yeah. Uh, thankfully I got the first goal. Uh, and then you know Simmer was was superb that day. It just and all. started on fire. They really yeah, up, it was. Then. You know, and, and to be honest, with you, the opening goal that you know that, that we got, you know, it was one of them to all of a sudden yeah. we could actually start breathing and start relaxing. I still remember that uh, they had the Kimble twins who okay, played for yeah. them. They made their debut. There was a young lad in goal. They were struggling yeah, for the goalkeeper yeah. I think, at the time. But um, you know, I was I was pleased that he let in five anyway. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, fantastic day. Yeah, and promotion. To the first division secured to yeah. become a first division player. Yeah. How did you find the transition from the second to uh, first division? Well, football? I'm saying in respect of football, it's, it's the same in the Premier League now. When you talk about the Championship, there is a huge difference between the two. Yeah. Um, the first year at, at, at Manchester City, I scored 13 goals. You know, scored a, a few little tap-ins from a little bit outside the box. Um, scored a header against Portsmouth, yeah. which uh, you know people still remember yeah, on social media. On yeah, social that's stuff. right. Uh, no, uh, you're heading, that's no, sure. no, no, no. Um, but you know that was inside the 18-yard box, which is like you know most unusual for me. Um, you know the goal against Wimbledon, which I scored, um, was Paul Power put the ball in. Yeah. I can't remember who dummy did, and I smashed it in with the left foot. Uh, and that was like, you know, everyone was like looking around, but, you know, didn't realise I had such a, a, a decent left foot as well. Um, but um, the, the step up was more difficult. Yeah. Um, 99 games I played in two years. Yeah. Um, you know, 48 the first year, 51 the second. So I was like, you know, the, the highest in respect of uh, appearances in two years. Um, scoring 13 the first year, won the next, and it was more difficult the, the second time round. City finished 15th in the league, yeah. Um, and then I left. We'll come to that, unfortunately. You, you <laughs> did, but this was the shirt, it was a change of shirt, yeah. You still sponsor it, I still sponsor it. So, this shirt belongs to Mick McCarthy, yeah, or did he wore yeah. one of the memories of Mick as a teammate? Was he quite a forceful character in the dressing room? Well, for my own, uh problems i shared a, a car with mick and tony cunningham for for Is quite some time so yeah he well. did yeah um and i shared a, a a car with those two you know tc was phenomenal but i think the two of them yeah, they were big say, friends they were big they, friends yeah. and they used to like not bully me but it was like you know cajoling me and this that whatever and yeah. i got to a stage i thought you know what i'm gonna drive myself <laughs> but mick was fantastic he was great uh, ambassador in the in the football club um you know great to have around uh, in the change room, and he's only one of the only footballers I know who plays golf left and right-handed. So I remember that when we went to Presbury this one day, uh, I was thinking that he's going to play right-handed, okay. and he came out with left-handed golf clubs. And I thought, okay, fine. But he was really, really good. But uh, instrumental in in everything that was good for for Man City, especially with the promotion year and then the second year. And he was always one of those guys to to help out the younger players sure. as well. So I want to take you to a crazy weekend in March 1986. We're at Old Trafford. We wear this style kit yeah. on a Saturday in a 2-2 draw. Yeah. How do you remember the Manchester derbies? They'd have been your first and only, unfortunately. Yeah, that, that I, 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 play, I played in two. Obviously, the, the, the draw at Old Trafford. I think there was a known goal and Clive yep. scored the... Uh, the second goal, but we lost 3 0 at home at our place. Yeah, that was quite early on in the season. Yeah, that's right? quite early on in the season. But the one thing I always remember that about that game at Main Road was that um, I was up against uh, Brian Robson. And, and I can still remember this ball coming to me. And as Robbo started to close me down, I flicked the ball over his head, caught the ball on the volley, passed it. And when I went past him, he going, when I went past him, he's gone, you know what? That was absolutely fantastic. Well yeah. done, son. That's great for and, you because this was quite yeah, early in your first division career. It was, career. yeah, and you know to have somebody, you know, of his esteem say that to me, even though he's on the red side uh, of Manchester, it, you know, I felt ten feet tall. Yeah. But you know, so you're only 21, 22. 21, 22. Time. I'm 22 in the uh, in the second year that I was there. Um, but uh, to lose 
to the red side is never very easy, is it? No, but it doesn't happen too often nowadays. No, right? thankfully not. So we, as we, we play United on the Saturday. Yeah. I remember much, did we travel down to the Full Members Cup straight from Old Trafford? Because oh, obviously we play Chelsea. Yeah, I'm saying that when I look back on that time, I can't believe that we were having to play Man United at Old Trafford one day and then play Chelsea in the Full Members Cup final the following day. It wouldn't happen now, would it? No. Be allowed. You know, when people turn around and say, well, you know, that would not happen. Secondly, the scoreline was 5 4. And we could understand why the game had so many goals because Chelsea also played Southampton the day before that. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, in that game as well, David Speedy scored a hat trick. And I think that was the first hat trick since Jeff Hurst. Okay. So that's what I was led to believe. Martin Lewis was unlucky not yeah. to get a hat trick. I think um, Joe Brufy claimed an own goal. Speeds ended up becoming a, a teammate of mine at Coventry and he always reminded me of it. <laughs> but. To actually play back-to-back -back games, you know, was totally unheard of. It would yeah. never happen nowadays. But I still remember when I was uh, at Plymouth, you know, I played uh, Boxing Day and the day, day after. Yeah. Uh, and the worst thing was, how many subs did we have? Yeah. We had one and, sub. And you survived. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what about this guy? Was it Alex Williams oh, who came at City and he's still, yeah. you know, busy on a match day at City nowadays? But there's a couple of keepers who wore this. Eric Nixon came in yeah. around that time. What do yeah. you remember of them two guys? Well, I always remember... Um, Alex, you know, a real gentle guy, you know, I loved Alex, you know, and, and if you ever fell down or anything like that, you can go and have a chat with him, and he always made you feel so, so much better. But I always remember with Alex, um, he got a credit card, um, oh no, he was, he was about to be offered a credit card, um, and he's seen it in the press, and it had A. Williams on it, and I said, well, surely not, they're going to do that, and he's gone, well, what do you mean? I saw look, they're using your name now. <laughs> I said, sure, you must be able to get some money out of it. He's going, ah, no, I can't be bothered about that. Don't worry about that. But Alex was so laid back, but what a great goalkeeper. Yeah. Eric, a little bit different. You know, Eric was actually very, very talkative, yeah. but what a nice guy, you know. And for us to have two keepers like that, you know, back in the day, yeah. you know, that really helped us. So this was the shirt going back to the Four Members Cup final. Yeah. So can you remember who came on? <laughs> I mean, that's a question I'll yeah, ask you later anyway, yeah. but yeah. So, David, I've, I've asked you many times before, why didn't you stick your shirt into your bag then at the end? I don't know, to be honest with you. I haven't got a clue. I'm saying it was always a case uh, back in the day that they were very stringent about who had shirts and this and yeah. whatever. And if it was a case of, like, you know, having a shirt, they were wanting to charge you something like 30, 40, 50 pounds, right. which back in those days was a reasonable sum of money. Yeah. Um, you know, when I first came to, to Manchester City, um, my salary was £350 a week. Um, but then I was given a bonus of £75 every time I appeared for the first team. So effectively, I was on four twenty five because I didn't miss a game. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when they turned around and said, well, you know, if you're going to keep your shirt, we're going to charge you. Yeah. I thought, I ain't doing that. <laughs> so now we're talking nowadays and uh, on hindsight i wish i had it yeah very different time yeah totally very different, different time totally David, different. you were a hugely popular player scored some fantastic goals but your career at city was all too brief after yeah. the second season you, you you're gone billy mcneil i don't think this gives you any memories of billy McNeil. yeah but how was your relationship with billy did you know you were going to leave at the end of the season how did that come it about? was a it was a total surprise um people always turn around and said was it a case because you played 99 games for City that if you played another game, there was money going to go to Plymouth Argyle? Right. That was never the case. Um, I was down in Cornwall at the time and I got a phone call from Tony Book. And Tony Book's given it, um, the gaffer's over in South America at the moment, he's doing commentary for the World Cup, uh, he doesn't want you. And I've gone, really? I said, I played 99 games yeah. for you. The first season I got promoted, I got the, the Junior Blue of the, the Year Award. I thought I might have got the uh, the Senior Award, but Paul Powell got it. Um, and then the, the second season, I'm still only 22 years of age, just turned 22. Yeah. You know, again, didn't miss a game, 51 games. Uh, and Bucky's gone, no, he doesn't want you. And I said, well, I'm really surprised. Why? Why? He said, well, he wants Perry Sucklin. And I've gone, well, why? You know, you've got Eric Nixon and whatever. He said, no, the gaffer doesn't want you. I said, well, I'm not leaving. I still had another year of my contract. Um, and I just said, well, you know, I'm not going. He said, well, I'll tell you now, if you don't go, you're going to rot in the, in the reserves. Yeah. 
And I said, well, you know, that's a bit, you know, I'll, I'll give you a lot of service for two years, done really well for that's you. For very good money as well. You know, for £65,000. He said, well, he wants Perry Suckling. End of. He said, I've got George Curtis and John Tillett coming up um, in a couple of days' time. I want you up here at Main Road. Um, and I said, well, I don't particularly want to go. So I saw John and George in the in the boardroom. Uh -huh. um, I saw Bucky as well, uh, and um, he just reiterated, "So look, you've got to go." To the, make your mind up for yeah. you then. To... So I said, "Well, if I'm going, I want all the rest of my contract all paid up." So um, he said, "Well, I'll get Bernard in. We'll have a little chat about it." So Bernard came in, and he's like, "Yeah, we can sort that out for you." Uh, John and George said, "Look, you know that's brilliant. You know we want you here." Years later, um, you know, talking to John, and he still remembers the time that we went up to the boardroom, we were having a chat and all that lot. Um, originally, when Manchester City offered a player in exchange for Perry Suckling, they said they took a gamble with me. Right. They said they couldn't believe they were going to let me go. Mm. He said, we absolutely loved you. The way that you scored goals, the, your engine room, and going left the and right. Out of the supporters now. And it yeah, was just, the they said, we just couldn't believe it. We could have said any name, and I'm sure that person would have gone. But he said, yeah. we desperately wanted you. Because he wasn't the first team keeper at Coventry as far as no. I'm aware. It would have no. been Big Steve. Yeah, Agrisovich. Yeah. Yeah, so. I can um, pronounce that. So yeah, that's, that's, that's all right. Just call him Oggy. <laughs> yeah. um, so. On that basis, I knew that uh, they wanted me. I didn't really want to go to Coventry, you know, not being disrespectful to, to Coventry. Mm -hmm. Smaller club than Manchester City, you know, in size and stature, etc. Um, but I thought, well, why should I stay with a club who doesn't yeah. want me? Let me go to a club that does want me. Um, and as it materialised, and we can come on to that, yeah. you know, we won the cup in, uh, in 87. Man City got relegated. Yeah. Billy McNeil got the sack. And then he went to Aston Villa the following year. He got the sack. So in respect of Manchester City, you know, and the fans, you know, I didn't want them to get the sack. But because of the uh, the bad feelings I mm. had towards Billy McNeil, I was uh, I was delighted that he got the sack. Yeah. Because a lot happened during the course of the two years. You know, he was more of a, a Jekyll and Hyde. He would come into the change room and he'd be like, you know... Uh, what are you all talking about? What are you so happy for? You know, and he'd have a go at us. He'd be effing and blasting. And then he'd go in and see Roy Bailey because the medical room was just a couple of doors away. And then he'd come back and he's gone, why is everyone so quiet? But the one story that I always remember and I always tell was when we, um, we played Scotland away. And Billy said to me, he said, look, you know, you're flying up with the team. He said, I will give you a lift back. Uh, he said, but what you need to do is come to uh, BBC Scotland, to the studios. And he said, uh, I'll drive you back to Manchester, you know, pick your car up from my house, etc. And I said, OK, I'll do that, Gaffer. So we went up to, to Scotland. We beat Scotland 1-0. Ian Rush scored the goal. Uh, I had to get a taxi from there to the studios, BBC Scotland. I waited out that outside for about half an hour. He came out. He's absolutely storming. And with that, he chucked the key at me. He's going, you can in drive the car. Yeah. He said, you're, you're a young lad, really. He's, he's, he's gone, but... you've ruined my night. He said, you're driving a car all the way back with the expletives. So I get into his Saab, uh, drive all the way down, uh, take him to, uh, I think it was Hale, where he lives. Um, as I got into the drive, he woke up, looked at his watch. He's gone, how fast were you going? You're never going to drive my in car again. Wow. With that, get out of the car. I'll see you tomorrow. And I just thought, you know what? Just because we beat Scotland, you don't have to be like that. Yeah. And but that's the way he was, you know. Um, a lot of people say a lot of good things about it's him. It's going to leave an impression on a, a, a young man. Yeah, you know, young absolutely. Man. You know, and it did leave a massive impression. That was only one of numerous amount of stories yeah. about him. Um, and I know that Gordon Davis had a, a major run in with him. You know, Sammy Mack as well. But um, you know, with myself being in such a young, impressionable player, to have somebody talk to me like that yeah. even though he's a manager you know i was so glad to leave so you do leave david after the, i mean city fans i'm sure i can speak for say they wish you were there longer yeah well, obviously the circumstances that was beyond your control so i mean you went on to win the fa cup and I, I, again i don't think there's a city fan who wouldn't have been pleased for you yeah so how does billy mcneil aside how do you sum up your two-year stay at main road i absolutely loved it you know, I've lived in a in a great place in Wilmslow, met some fantastic friends, you know, players, 
you know, I still keep in touch with uh, people like Steve Kinsey, Andy May, uh, Neil McNabb through social media, etc. Um, but it was a great time. You know, I had a great relationship with my next door neighbor as well. Um, he was actually the uh, airline pilot for uh, uh, Monarch Airlines. And sometimes when my, my wife at the time went back to Cornwall, Ken would turn around to me and say, well, you know, what are you doing tonight? I said, well, nothing, Ken. He said, oh, you fancy flying to uh, Menorca? That's I've gone, true. I've gone, yeah. He said, right, just bring your passport. So we get in his car, get off to Manchester Airport, go through security. He says, right, okay, in you go. So I'm there in the cockpit, pilots, co-pilot, engineer, stewardesses. David, what are you drinking? Oh, can I have a, I'll have a glass of fizz. Yeah, not a problem. So there we are. I'm getting a little bit tipsy going to Menorca or Mallorca, Ibiza. I went several times uh, in those two years yeah. abroad with Ken in the plane. Uh, Dock down, 45 minute turnaround, still drinking, bit of food, back back, back to Manchester, back into his house, a few drinks. Fantastic. Sunday off, back in Monday. <laughs> So, so I had Ken a, to Coventry so, with you. So I wish, which Ken would have come to me, but you know I had friends like that. You know it was difficult when I first went into Wilmslow because uh, the, the builders were actually Man United fans. So when I had snags in the, in the house, they refused to come into the house. So okay. it was it was one of those that it was so partisan as it is nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I had issues with my house, and it took me months and months to get these snags done because they refused to come into the house. That's not good. <laughs> David, Manchester City are obviously a very different club these days. So I want to show you a couple of midfielders. So which one of these would you have been in today's game? Oh, you know, when, when, you, when you show me those two shirts, you know, they are unbelievable players. And I'm so pleased with Bernardo because there was one stage, I think just over a year ago, where potentially he was going yes, to leave. Yeah, there's a lot of noises. You know, there are a lot of noises about Real Madrid, etc. And I was so, so pleased that he stayed. You know, he is an integral part of that midfield area. Kevin De Bruyne, as, what can we say about him? You know, I would love to have played with those two guys. Yeah. You know, what an engine house. You know, great uh, technical expertise both of them have got. Um, and, you know, I have the pleasure of being able to watch them, albeit on TV. Mm -hmm. um, they are so, so good. And then we have Phil Foden as well. You know, Phil just signed a new lucrative contract. We're watching some special players, aren't we? Yeah, times, and, and so. to be honest with you, I know that he signed was it a five or seven year contract. And I think I put on social media, scrap that contract, just give him a lifelong contract. <laughs> you know, because he's going to be there. He was a ball boy. He's grown up through the, yeah. the academy, etc. You know, he's Manchester City through and through. And all these players, David, I don't think uh, Guardiola or the club get credit for. They're all hungry. Yeah. They're all, there's no sulkers, there's no excuses, no. there's no, they do their job yeah. and, and you can see the enthusiasm and, yeah. you know, and it's credit to the manager that he keeps a squad. It is, that, and you know, you know I, I always turn around and say about managers, be a manager of a ship, don't be a manager of a rowing boat, because in a rowing boat you might have three or four favourites, but in a ship you've got to look after the whole yeah. lot and it's how you actually manage them, how you are going to be the captain, you know, how you're going to get the respect from your players. And like you see, you know, with Manchester City, you know, Grealish is not playing at this moment in time. Has he got a monk on? No, he's not. I think he's tending his vegetables in his garden at the moment, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, joking apart, um, you know, you can't have that in no. subordination. But they wouldn't, have... no. wouldn't be there. They simply wouldn't be there. And if, if that happened, Pep would get rid of him anyway, yeah. you know, because he wants Pep's players. And, you know, they are unbelievable players. And those two, especially Phil Foden. But... Uh, you can talk about Ruben Diaz. Laporte, yeah. Laporte, I've known since he's been 17 years of age. Oh, okay. You know, when he was a, you know, he was a French Basque who went to Bilbao, you know, and basically Bilbao, as you know, was a, a place where they only allowed Basque players, but he came over from France, and I think he's only one or two ever French Basques to represent, okay. I think, Bilbao. So yeah. I've known him such a, a young uh, young lad. I know that he's had injury problems, etc. Yeah. Um, just needs a settled run again. Yeah, he does. Get, get um, but back. what I like, you know, is that they've got players in positions who can come in if there's issues, yeah. as we see with Kyle Walker at mm -hmm. this moment in time. Superb. So, David, I'm going to test your knowledge on your City career here. So oh, you no. may hate <laughs> me or love me for this one. So, who scored City's goals during your debut, the 2-2 draw at Wimbledon? I would, I would imagine maybe somebody like uh, Gordon Smith. Gordon Smith was one. Oh, now you're testing me, aren't you? And the other one was a Scottish striker as well. Wouldn't be Jim Tommy. No, 
Derek Parlane. Derek Parlane. So who was the city skipper that day? Well, you'd have to think if it was, it'd be Paul Power. It was indeed. But there's two out of two, really. During the 84-85 season, who scored the most league goals? Gordon Smith or David Phillips? Both. David Phillips got 11. Oh. Gordon Smith got 12. Did he? I think I got 13 in total that year. This was league on their yeah, ones. Yeah. So who was the only ever present player during the 84-85 promotion campaign? Me. No. Was it not? It was not. Oh. It was Alex Williams. Was it Alex Williams? So who laid the ball back for you to strike the final goal in the Charlton promotion game? I would I would like to think it was somebody like Simo. No. Kins? It was Steve Kinsey. Steve Kinsey. I know I'm asking you, these are not, you know, yeah, a couple of years ago. You, I, you could give me a hint and I could have actually swatted up on it. <laughs> so, which three players made City debuts on the opening day of the 85-86 First Division season? So this was away at Coventry. Oh, blimey. Well, I know one thing, that Earl Barrett was supposed to come in at right back, but Billy turned around and said, well, no, I want you to go and play right back. Um, God, that's a good question. Was it something like Jim Melrose? No. No. One of them scored. Well, the only goal with one one draw. Right, okay. Um, so we've got Mark Lillis. I was going to say Booner. Nigel Johnson. Nigel center Johnson, center off, off, yeah. yeah. I think he had a bad run of injuries. Yeah, yeah, City. yeah. And you'll kick yourself with this one. Go Sammy on. McElroy. Sammy Mack. What a player he was. So who scored City's two goals at Old Trafford on the 22nd of March, 86? Oh, two two draw. Yeah, it was an own goal and, and that was Clive as well. Who got the own goal? Pushing it now. Go on then. Arthur Alveston. Was it? Blimey. <laughs> so who replaced David Phillips in the 58th minute of the 1986 Four Members Cup final? Uh, it was either Simmer or it was all Bakes. Graham Baker. Yeah. Who did you score your only league goal in the 85-86 season against? Good question. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> oh, you got one that season. I know, I know. I'm, st I'm, st I'm still going on the 11 goals I scored the season before. That pre-season trip was in January, so it might have done you, done you good because it was against Southampton on the right. 11th of January and okay. in a 1-0 game. So against who did you make your final City appearance in a 1-1 draw and who scored? Uh, I'm going to guess that it was Mark Lillis and I'm going to say it's Luton. It is Luton Town, but it was Gordon Davis. Was it Gordon Davis? So what's David Phillips of 2022 up to? David Phillips of 2022 is uh, working media-wise um, for... Can I mention the name? Absolutely. Okay, so Sky. Um, so I do a lot of work with the, the Premier League. Uh, also IMG, where I cover quite a lot of the, the European games in respect of Nations League, uh, European Championships, etc. I'm the lead coach at a company called Future Pro, which is based in Coventry. Um, and I've been doing that for quite some time. So after my career has finished, you know, I've been involved uh, at Coventry City. I've been at Derby County. I've been head coach at uh, Warwickshire College for 19 years. And, but now I've gone to Future Pro, but I've still got a lot of work with media as yeah. well. So you're a busy man. Yes, I am. David, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for popping in. You're very welcome.